So recording has started. So once again, I'm Brianna Belafontaine Krupski. I am with the Maine State Department of Education's Office of Teaching and Learning, and we are being joined today um, by Kevin Lynch from the National Constitution Center. So he's going to help us walk through what the Constitution Center has for various different wonderful resources on elections, civil dialogue, um, and their really awesome scholar exchange program. So Kevin, I'll let you introduce yourself. Well, thank you so much, Brianna, and thank you all for joining today. Uh, so my name is Kevin Lynch. I am the manager of student and teacher programs at the National Constitution Center, um, which is a history museum and nonprofit in Philadelphia. Um, I've been with the Constitution Center for 12 years now. Um, the first couple years or so working with the physical museum. Um, but in the last few years, like most of us, uh, transitioning to some virtual programming. Um, and it's really given me an opportunity to work more closely um, with wonderful teachers across the country. Um, so thank you to all for everything that you do. Um, you really are at the front lines for having these constitutional conversations and civic conversations. Um, and as always, if there's anything that we at the Constitution Center can do to make your days just a little bit easier, um, please always let us know. Um, so thank you, and Brianna, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for coming on. So um, a quick agenda real quick. Um, so we are going to just basically walk through the National Constitution Center's available resources that they have on their website for us um, as teachers. I had the pleasure of working with the NCC in a couple different capacities over the last couple years. Um, they have some really great programs for teachers um, there, and they have some really awesome, rich resources to bring into your classrooms. They can be pretty adapted to middle school and high school. So I currently teach at Scarborough High School right now. I am a high school civics and econ teacher. Um, and and I find a plethora of things um, on the NCC's website. So what we're going to highlight today and keeping in tone with sort of some of the themes um, that have been coming out from our newsletter at the DOE, um, civil dialogue resources. How do we engage students in good civil dialogue in our classrooms, particularly when we have times of contentious you know, topics and things that can kind of create some division? How do we engage our students in having civil dialogues about tough topics. Um, elections, right? We're in the heat of election cycle. We're about two and a half weeks away from a major election. Um, what are some resources we could use um, ready in our classroom? And then um, a couple other aspects for a teacher's scholar exchange program for your classes. I'll share a little bit of my experience with those programs and how you guys can access them. And newsletters from the NCC if you want to sign up um, and how you get that information on what they offer for teachers is wonderful. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to have Kevin share his and walk us through some of these. All right. Well, thank you so much, Rihanna. Uh, again, teachers, thank you all for being here. Um, and I'm excited to share some of the resources that the National Constitution Center has to offer. Uh, so let me go ahead and share my screen here. Um, I will bring up our website. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to walk you through some of the offerings that we have at the center. Um, and I want to begin with the center itself and the, the mission statement, if you will, um, from the Constitution Center, because we were chartered by Congress um, with two aspects in mind. Um, the first of which was to, oh, pardon me there, um, the first of which was to be able to um, have a physical space um, within the proximity of the um, Independence Mall where the Constitution was signed. So that's our first check. We do have a physical building. Um, but it's the second part here uh, in the quote, to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis uh, in order to increase awareness and understanding of the Constitution among the American people. Um, and that nonpartisan part is something that we rigidly adhere to. Um, and the way that we try to do that is to bring together the, the best minds, the top scholars, historians, lawyers, judges, constitutional experts on all sides of every constitutional topic and debate and argument. Um, and 
That way we can present to you the best arguments on all sides of issues um, and allow you and your students to be able to have discussions. Um, and that is really sort of at the heart of, you know, keeping nonpartisan um, and making sure that we present all the arguments. Um, we also have a three-step educational framework that we work to try to achieve this dialogue over the Constitution. Um, and those three steps, um, the first is building a historic foundation through storytelling. Um, so for your students, um, for whom perhaps, you know, history or civics or government might not be their favorite subject, um, but there's as they study in your class, there's a particular figure, a particular moment from history, a movement, something that causes the light bulb to go off. And, you know, I would really like to learn more about that. That interests me. Um, so that's where we start, you know, and teachers are so incredibly um expert at that, uh, of telling stories and being an engaging storyteller, um, either to use stories as a hook to introduce a particular topic or event that you're going to teach, um, or using stories as a way of illustrating a point. Um, and that's really where we start. Once we've built up that historic foundation through storytelling, um, then the next step is to connect it to the Constitution. And that's where we hope that our resources that we want to share um, can make that connection. Um, how is it that whatever you're talking about or the story that we've just heard ties into the Constitution? Um, and the first page on our website that I want to share um, is our sort of constitutional resources by topic. So this is our main home page. Um, and if you go to education here, this tab, this specific area, um, is really where we, um, the home for a lot of our teacher resources. Um, and if you go to classroom resources by topic, uh, we have all of these different topics grouped into three sections, uh, the articles of the constitution, amendments to the constitution, um, and then constitutional concepts ranging from constitutional conversations, federalism and separation of powers, um, and a timely one, uh, national elections and the electoral college. Um, so we have about 25 of these different topic pages that you can go to. Um, and when we present each one of these resources, we do it in a way that is sort of through the, the ultimate goal is to be able to have civil dialogue. Um, so that's the third step of our educational framework, um, building a foundation through storytelling, making constitutional connections, um, and then being able to have a conversation about those topics. Um, and that's a, such a challenge for all of us today, uh, is how do we have civil dialogue um, and productive conversation about what can be very difficult topics sometimes, very contentious opinions um, ranging into political discussion um, that can ultimately go back and forth. Um, so how do we do that? Um, and at the Constitution Center, we try to do that by encouraging students to separate their constitutional views from their political views. Um, so you might have very strong opinions about uh, the president should do this or Congress should not do that. Um, and those are incredibly important conversations to have, and there is certainly a time and a place for that. Um, but what we try to do at the center and using all of these different resource topics um, is to encourage students to frame their conversations around constitutional questions. So not asking necessarily what should be done, but asking what can be done or is allowed to be done under the Constitution. Um, and that really has two benefits, uh, at least, um, but two that we highlight um, is one, it has a way of bringing people together who might never agree on an issue politically. You know, one person's way over here and then over here, um, but perhaps they might be able to come together in agreeing that the Constitution does say this, the court has said this, we agree that this can be done, um, even though we might never agree on whether it should or shouldn't be. Um, so there's opportunity to have middle ground there. Um, and then it's also, we find just a much better way of having a conversation. Um, so for example, if you were to ask, um, we use uh, the Fourth Amendment as an example. If we were to pose a political question to your students, um, should a public school principal search a student's locker? You would imagine the responses that you might get by posing such a question in your classroom. Um, it might be a very emphatic answer, a passionate answer, uh, perhaps a one word answer. Um, and where and where can you really take the conversation from there? Um, you know, do you just accept the student's answer? Do you try to change their mind? 
Um, but if you were to pose the same kind of general uh, hypothetical in a constitutional format, and the way that we do that is posing, does the Fourth Amendment allow for a public school principal to search a student's locker? Well, then there's so many more avenues that you can go. You know, oh, we're talking about the Fourth Amendment here. What does the text of the Fourth Amendment say? Um, have there been cases about the Fourth Amendment before? Um, you know, what has the court ruled? Um, we're talking about unreasonable searches and seizures. What was the nature of the search? Um, so there's just much better ways of having a conversation, so many different options you can go. Um, so that's really the way we set it up. Um, but of course, it's the teachers who really are able to execute such incredible conversations. Um, so, Brianna, as we're talking about mm. civil dialogue here, um, you know, we, the, the center, we're always so excited to hear about the conversations and how this actually looks in the classroom. Um, so could you perhaps share um, how this the, this is applied in the classroom, having constitutional conversations? Yeah. So we, um, so I know if you want to go ahead and click, I'm thinking click on the civil dialogue and constitutional conversations link. So um, I know something that I have done often in my classrooms, whether it be, um, you know, an honors level class, AP level, or a general ed civics class, um, I have used a little bit of some of the video clips you guys have and kind of trying to get them to think about you know, what's the point? What is a civil dialogue? Kind of starting those things out. Like, how do you have a conversation about some tough topics from time to time in a manner that is respectful? Um, I think we are, obviously, as we know, we live in some times where it's a little um, contentious. So kind of trying to model some good civil dialogue discussions for students is also a really great avenue. Um, but I think at any point in time, teachers could bring this topic up in their classroom. It could be great for kicking things off in the year, kind of setting a good tone for class norms. Um, but I know we definitely have looked at the constitutional conversations and civil dialogue uh, video in my class. We have looked at some of the briefing documents. And we'll start out with like, you know, a silly kind of question, like, you know, which is better, M&Ms or Reese's, you know, and kind of have that little debate. And then we'll get into kind of some more serious topics and, again, get into that conversation of thinking about, you know, separating the politics out from the constitutional questions is really good. But I'll have you let you share some ideas on the screen now. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So for each of these topics uh, that we see on our web page here, um, you have all these resources that uh, um, Brianna talked about. Um, a particular um, powerful one um, is this video here. Um, Justice, uh, former Justice Stephen Breyer visited the Constitution Center about 10 years ago um, and was asked a question um, from a student. Um, you know, how do you and the other justices ever, um, or how do you come to decisions? Um, do you ever get into fights when deciding these potential, potential cases? Um, and Justice Breyer gave this wonderful uh, kind of summary of how the justices are able to civilly have conversations, even if they might strongly, strongly disagree. Um, and it's about four minutes of just civil dialogue gold. Um, so that's one of those that we make available for free on our website. Um, and we encourage all teachers um, to use that. It's a wonderful way to start the discussion. Um, so we can have that. I don't know, Brian, if it would be helpful to play that now or as long as we provide the link for teachers to use. Um, but it's a particularly helpful one. Yeah, I think we can uh, definitely provide the link. Absolutely. All right. Um, and then with each of these, and we will get into our scholar exchange program in a little bit. Um, but for each of these topics, we have recorded classes um, where it's moderated by a member of the Constitution Center's team, and we bring in a scholar um, to discuss each topic. Um, so even if you are not able to join us for a live class, um, you're able to view these recordings here, um, where scholars talk about each of these constitutional concepts, um, and we've arranged them into different levels. So depending on what grade you teach, um, we have a middle school version, we have high school versions, um, we'll even have perhaps perhaps a higher level version where the Constitution Center's president and CEO, Jeffrey Rosen, will be on with one of the leading scholars of this particular issue. So there's all these different levels um, of all talking about the same topic. Um, briefing documents where our in-house scholars have prepared lots of information uh, about each topic, um, the PowerPoints that are used, we provide those, um, as well as worksheets and lesson plans um, that are developed and uh, ideally kind of ready for the classroom. 
Um, so all of that is available on the website um, that you're welcome to use um, whenever it fits. Um, and what's great about these resources, as well as um, we've developed entire curriculums for teaching the Constitution. Uh, there's a, a separate page on the website for Constitution 101. And you can use as much of and as little of these resources as you would like. Um, so if you, let's say you're very comfortable talking about the presidency, um, but you could use some help when it comes to talking about the Supreme Court. You know, you can pick and pull from these resources to fit your curriculum um, and to fit the needs in your class. And you can know that all of the resources that you find on our website are, A, sort of put together with this thought of engaging in constitutional questions and asking constitutional questions, um, and that they were thought of by teams of the best lawyers, best scholars um, from across every political spectrum. So if there's ever a question about, you know, is this resource biased or is it partisan, um, you can be assured that these resources um, have that sort of nonpartisan stamp of approval um, that yes. top scholars have worked together. Um, so I don't know, Brianna, if, if that's um, really helped you in your classroom, um, but certainly when it comes to having these conversations, it's a great place to start. Yeah, and it, it really is too. And I think because we are looking at, you know, I think in certain towns and cities and things like that, I know up here in Maine, it's not, you know, as contentious, but there are, you know, you have some thoughts and people are wanting, you know, more transparency with curriculum. And I think that's definitely something from a teaching standpoint that we appreciate is the fact that, you know, you there is a true nonpartisan and approach and it's very inform informal, um, informative information that we're getting from various different experts as well. Um, I have used uh, the worksheets as well in class. They are super adaptable to um, age groups. I've used them with juniors and sophomores. Um, so I definitely can vouch for the fact that they're well laid out. They're very step-by-step. -step, um, and my students um, were able to kind of follow along with some of the um, recorded lessons and info sessions with some of the experts and pros while using the worksheets as well. Fantastic. Um, so yes, absolutely. You know, please feel free to make use of these resources um, whenever it fits into your curriculum uh, and what you're teaching. Um, so Brianna, and if there's any concluding thoughts about civil dialogue um, before we move on to our, our next topic, um, which are specifically uh, election-based resources. Election-based ones, yeah. So again, I just, I know I wanted to highlight the civil dialogue ones. I know um, if you're I know we have a couple people joining us today. Thank you. It's our first one. Um, we have a newsletter that's going out um, from the DOE website that myself and the two other, the art fellow and the personal finance fellow are working on. And one of our first highlights for the civics round was trying to touch base on thinking about those civil dialogue questions. Um, I think it's a good way to frame talking about said topics like the election. So absolutely. And that's a perfect segue um, into one of our newer resources that we have on our web page. Um, and this is, again, a response to teachers. Um, and yes, we will create resources, but it's ultimately we want to respond to what are the conversations in the classroom? What is it that the students are asking? And what is it that the teachers need to be able to effectively carry out these constitutional conversations? Um, so we routinely we have um, our, our teacher advisory council. Uh, that we consult with teachers who work with us regularly. Um, but teachers, always feel free to contact us, reach out to us, um, education at constitutioncenter.org, um, and let us know what resources you need in the classroom. Um, and we are more than happy to either point in the right direction of existing resources, um, or if need be, create entirely new areas um, where we can compile resources. Um, and of course, timely, uh, important constitutional events do come up. Um, and that brings us, of course, to the current election. Um, and we have heard from teachers um, really asking for resources when it comes to talking about the election, um, how the Electoral College works. What happens procedurally between election day and inauguration day? Um, what have been some past presidential elections? Um, so we've worked, we listen to teachers and really try to make sure that we're supplying that need. Um, so this is one of our newer pages on the website where we've compiled and brought together um, our resources to help provide as much information as we can um, for talking about the Constitution uh, and talking about the upcoming election. 
Um, so we group it by topic, um, and these are just several articles that we have, um, specifically talking about main questions with the presidency. Um, how much power does the president have? Uh, what does Article 2 specifically say about the president? Um, most of our topics begin with a quick constitutional analysis of where exactly does this power come from? Um, so an analysis of Article 2, um, what have been some questions about the presidency from the founding up to the present day? Um, what have been some modern examples of questions about the exercise of presidential power? Um, so that's all included in that particular bucket, Article 2. Um, the 12th Amendment, of course, the Electoral College, um, this procedural system, students asking how the Electoral College works. Um, so we put together a number of resources specifically about the Electoral College um, and how that was changed, the, the 12th Amendment. Um, you know, it's a, a wonderful story, again, for students, how the, the framers didn't necessarily take into account for political parties um, and posing to students that if we operated under the, the original form of the Electoral College with the top two vote getters, um, in our own sense today, the top Republican and the top Democrat and the prospect of them having to govern together as president and vice president, um, it does make for very interesting conversations uh, when posed that hypothetical to the students. Um, how does the power of the presidency and elections and the role of Congress perhaps fit into this? Um, so we have Article 1, Section 4 in there about Congress, specifically what might happen if Congress does have to become involved in an election. Um, and then further on down, recommended resources for uh, Supreme Court cases. Um, we really highlight and, and use cases um, from the Supreme Court to help in some of these teachings, um, specifically because there's so many of them and, and they can be applied to pretty much any constitutional topic that you're talking about. Um, but also, it's a wonderful opportunity to keep it constitutional rather than political um, by presenting the court is, you know, the, the facts of the case, what are the key constitutional questions, um, and then you're able to access the majority opinion, and if there is one for that case, the dissent. Um, so it's a wonderful opportunity to pre present students with multiple arguments um, and have them perhaps argue each point, um, perhaps even the argument that they might disagree with. Yes. Um, so that's a really helpful way of doing it. Um, Brian, I don't know if that's, um, if you've used sort of that, you know, mock trial or, you know, Supreme Court analysis as a way of teaching, um, but we found it to be something that teachers ask for. Yes, it's a, uh, we, we actually have a pretty nice, robust mock trial program in the state of Maine as well. So a little mock trial competitions, but it's, it's, court cases are really interesting. I find they're really a great way to tie in to kind of any sort of understanding about the federal government process. And the kids really get into thinking about the two sides of the the majority opinion, the concurring opinions and dissenting opinions too. So they're really good avenues and tools, particularly thinking about too the election process as well. Absolutely. Um, and one resource that we will share um, in addition to the elections, but oh, we have our Supreme Court cases library. Um, so that's a relatively new one on our website here. If you go to the, the first tab and drop down to this, Yes. cases library. Um, and this has been, again, a resource that we consulted with top scholars from across the political spectrum um, who agree on which cases they would choose. Um, so, And we've filtered it by topic. So depending on where you are in your curriculum, um, we have court cases that can apply. Um, so if, let's say, you're talking about voting rights, uh, or you're talking about um, you know, a particular amendment or so, we'll go back up to voting rights because that's the timely one. Um, you click on that particular topic and it will filter into specific cases that deal with questions about voting. Um, so for each one of these cases, if you were to cl click on said case, you will be presented with um, key excerpts from the justices um, in making their opinion. Um, the vote of the court um, and which justices came down on which side of that constitutional issue um, and scholars and a summary of why this particular case was selected um, to be included in this library. Um, key facts of the case. Um, and then if you really wanted to, um, for overachieving students who want to read the entire opinion of the court, uh, we have that option as well. Yeah. Um, so we want to provide you with as much use of this as possible. Um, so Rihanna, I don't know if this has been one that um, you've particularly used, but again, just speaking to it's using the cases of the court, has it's a really helpful way to keep things from the perspective of a lawyer or a judge rather than a politician. Yes, exactly. I know I haven't used this exact case, but I do like the the um, so how succinct the summaries are. Um, and I think they are also ones that, you know, they're not so long that if you needed to modify it for a different reading level or something like that, it's it's 
it's tangible um, for a multitude of different levels of classes as well. So I think it's a nice layout as well for, for teachers to access in their classrooms. Absolutely. Um, so returning to the, um, the homepage here and our election resources page, um, in addition to Supreme Court cases, um, various interactives that we have from the uh, exhibits page. Uh, we have various exhibits, um, currently one on like when connection to voting, we have one on the 19th Amendment and how women won the vote. Um, so to the extent that we are able to take interactives from our in-house exhibits um, and apply them to virtual learning, um, we've included those resources on the website as well. Um, as always, there's activity guides, worksheets, lesson plans that go with that. Um, and then we've compiled the best informational videos um, that scholars that we've partnered with, um, if we've done evening town hall programs or professional learning sessions for teachers, um, everything on our website that is applicable um, to use in a class about voting rights, about the powers of the presidency, about the electoral college. Um, we've tried to include that here. Um, the most difficult part would be combing through the website, and we've tried to do that for you and present everything here. Um, so all of these resources are available to use. Um, and again, it's an example of how we try to respond to what the teachers need. Um, so you let us know what resources you need to be able to conduct these conversations in your class uh, most effectively, um, and we'll do our best to provide you with them. You know, um, if you want to scroll back up a little bit, kind of just highlight this opportunity with the virtual museum experiences for students. Um, so I know that actually, if you look down there, Tuesday, October 29th, um, there's some of these opportunities, too, that sometimes the Constitution Center does where you can actually have a class join in live um, and hear um, from Get, get a tour live from some of their museum exhibits if it's a real especially for us um, and some of our folks that are up more in rural Maine right we might not have the ability to get down to Philadelphia um, at any point in time and in, in the students educational time or you know we don't might not have the funding these things are free and it really does kind of invite some of these more tangible experiences for students in your classroom and I know that's um one of the things that I've been the most excited about um, with National Constitution Center's resources is some of these more interactive experiences that you can do for students. Um, and I know, so that, I know that's an opportunity as well. I know we got about 15 minutes left and I know, I think one of the other topics I wanted to bring up was the concept of a scholar exchange and how can you invite some experts into your classroom if you wanted to have a particular topic talked about at a deeper level. Um, I've done a couple different scholar exchanges during my you know last couple of years at a couple of different schools I've worked at. Um, my kids have loved it. They've had such a good experience with the scholar exchange program. So um, what is the scholar exchange program and how can teachers access it? Absolutely. Um, and again, you speak to the importance of having a, a live class or being able to engage in real time when talking about these issues. Um, and that is something that we've really tried to build into the Scholar Exchange program. Um, so Scholar Exchanges are 45-minute virtual classes. Um, our default program is to use Zoom, um, but we're more than happy to accommodate teachers who use other platforms. Um, and it is a way for students to be able to engage directly with a constitutional lawyer, judge, historian, um, the scholars that we work with. Um, you know, we can do, you know, public classes, say on Constitution Day, where we bring in, you know, hundreds of students can join, um, but they often can't necessarily engage directly with our scholars. Um, so these programs we're able to offer directly to teachers where one class or a, a few classes can join, but it's a much smaller learning environment. Um, and it's grown to the point where we have enough scholars who participate in this program that we can offer it um, nearly entirely teacher driven um, in the sense that you, the teachers, tell us the date, the time and the topic that works for you. And we can take the program from there. Um, so if you were interested in having a session on the Bill of Rights next Wednesday at noon Eastern time, we could make that work. Um, we'll send you the prep material that includes the questions that we'll be asking. Uh, we will we'll book the scholar who will then come and speak with your class. Uh, a member of the Constitution Center's education team will be on hand to moderate the session and facilitate any conversation that you have with the scholar. Um, and we're able to have these conversations. Um, so we have uh, about, 
oh, I would say maybe 15 or 16 topics that are currently in our lineup. Um, some of the more prominent ones, um, we offer them year round. Um, so you, if you can always book a session on the Bill of Rights or federalism and separation of powers. Um, we also have ones that are more specific to a various point in the year. Um, so right now you can book a class on the Electoral College. Um, we just developed a new session on Native Americans and the Constitution. Um, so, so on this webpage, you can learn all you need to know about the program. And because it's virtual, there's a lot of flexibility there when it comes to um, the number of um, classes, classrooms, and students who can be involved. Um, so if you teach six classes in a day and you would like to be able to kind of uniformly have your lesson, we can schedule six individual sessions where you can bring each of your classes. Uh, it might be a different scholar for each class, um, but we could accommodate multiple classes per day. Um, Adversely, if let's say you and three other teachers in your department would all like to participate in one class at the same time, we would have the capacity for four or five classes, however many, to come to the same lesson and they would all be there on screen um, and you could participate across your department. Um, teachers who they when they participate, um, we'll, we'll send them the Zoom link, they can join. Um, and depending on what works best for you, some teachers will join with one computer and turn that computer around to face the entire class. Um, if you have the capacity for students to log on on their own devices, that works too. Um, the one difference we've noticed is that students, when it's directly facing them, they tend to communicate verbally as opposed to asking and answering questions in the chat if they have the option to do so on their own devices. Um, either one works for us, um, but the most important point to make is that this is not at all designed to be a lecture. Um, the students very much will have opportunities to engage with the scholar. Um, we have designated questions, uh, sort of conversation starters that we will pose throughout the session. Um, and we provide those to the teachers ahead of time. Um, so if you wanted to sort of prep your students for those or have students think of their answers ahead of time, um, we found that to be valuable. They know what the questions are gonna be going in. Um, and then there's also designated conversation breaks where uh, students can ask any questions that they might have of the scholar. Um, so it's very much a unique program uh, in the sense that we're able to engage with various scholars. Um, it might be a, depending on each class, it's a, a different scholar who's able to offer different perspectives on each issue. So it's never really the same lesson twice, um, but we do provide sort of the, the framework. So the big questions, the guiding questions, um, the cases that we feature, the stories that we tell, um, they will be uniform. Um, but it can be useful sometimes to hear different perspectives from the scholars who we work with. Um, so it's really an engaging program, um, one that it continues to grow um, every year, um, but it's a really unique opportunity only for us um, to learn with the teachers and the scholars, um, but one for the students as well. Um, Sabrina, I said you, you've you uh, done the, the before, um, and we try to make it as easy a sign-up process yeah. and ways for teachers to be involved as possible. It's really easy. I can't stress how beneficial this will be for your classroom enough. I've done, I think, three or four. Um, I've done various different levels of classes. I did one with a more seniors AP group, and then I used them in like our general ed government class. Um, my general ed government class last year, we did the voting rights um, scholar exchange. Can't remember the gentleman that joined us as our guest, but he, he was awesome. He, I had, the kids were engaged prior to that. I gave them like the questionnaire the night before. So they kind of came in perhaps with some couple questions and they were, they really liked it. I know walking from, they're like, I can't believe we just talked to like a federal judge from, you know, Philadelphia. And like, they were so excited about it. Um, and I think they just really appreciated the ability to kind of have that outside perspective. I know sometimes we can think about, you know, we had a lot of Zooming happening for a couple of years in education, but this is a different kind of experience. It does kind of feel like a field trip um, before your classroom. And it is nice and tailored for um, what you need. You know, you get 45 minutes. That usually is pretty adaptable for most of our bell schedules in Maine. And the topics are really great. And I think we're definitely adaptable. So if you can sneak one in um, for the year, it's really going to be beneficial. You're going to get a deeper dive into that topic and your kids are going to like it. They're going to have fun with it. They're going to engage and they're going to, they're going to be talkative from what I've found. It's, it's been a really good experience for me and my classes.
Excellent. Thank you. And yes, that's we, we really do want to make this as easy an experience. You know, the teachers, you, you all have enough to do. Um, so if we can make it just a little bit easier for you to participate and not have to do much of the heavy lifting for once, um, that's really what we strive for. Um, you'll notice down here, Rena, you mentioned uh, AP class level. Um, so for those teachers who do teach at the AP level, mm -hmm. um, in the spring, we offer classes specifically geared towards preparation for the AP exams. Um, we have classes on AP founding documents. AP Supreme Court cases, um, again, geared towards specifically the material that the students would need for those exams. Um, but not just for AP, um, we do want to emphasize that for each of these classes, we have designated levels. Um, so we engage primarily with middle school and high school, um, but occasionally uh, upper elementary school and college as well. Um, and we try to be very conscious about tailoring the questions that are asked, the material that is being shared to make sure that it is fitting the level um, of the students who are joining that particular day um, and that they can get the most out of it. Um, and there's also room to customize these programs uh, to to an extent. You know, we of course have the the framework and the questions, but you know, if let's say if you are doing a class on you know landmark Supreme Court cases, um, but you would really like us to touch on one specific case that you've just covered, um, you know, feel free in your sign up process to reach out and say, you know, is it possible that we add in this material? Um, is it possible that we can cover this case? Um, and give it enough time, we can absolutely communicate that to the scholars yeah. and tailor the program a bit to fit any specific needs uh, that you have in your class. Um, and then lastly, when it comes to sign up, um, we have, um, once you're on the website, there is a drop down button here um, where you can schedule. That'll take you to a survey um, that'll have all the information about available dates, available topics. Um, but you can also reach out directly via email. Um, Sabrina, I don't know if you're going to be sharing either of our emails in the follow up, um, but feel free to contact us at the Constitution Center and let us know. Um, really, all we need to get this conversation started is dates that work for you the times that work and the topics. Um, but if you have any questions about the program or if there's any more information that we can provide before you sign up, uh, absolutely reach out and let us know. And we're happy to provide as much information as we can before you decide whether you'd like to join. But we hope to see you soon. Yeah, it's again, I just stress like super invaluable, um, really helpful. And it is truly easy peasy to set up. Um, it was really just me sending you an email last year to be like, hey, I want to do a voting rights one. Can we set that up? And we made it work um, with our schedule, which was really awesome. So um, I know the last thing I know if uh, to highlight, if possible, um, I know the NCC, you know, has a couple other teacher programs. Is there a newsletter or a spot where we could sign up or what might be the best way to keep in touch with kind of monthly offerings? Absolutely. Um, so we do have a series of newsletters available. Um, if you scroll down to the very bottom of our homepage, um, there is contact right there, and that's all you need to get started. Um, you enter your email address, um, and we have a series of different newsletters, um, depending on if you're a you know, local educator, um, which I don't think anyone on this call would necessarily be local from Philadelphia, but depending on what level you teach, um, what how frequently you would like communication from us, um, we have an education newsletter that goes out every Sunday, every Sunday evening. So if you're interested in keeping up with the latest offerings from the Constitution Center, um, upcoming evening professional development programs, um, that's another avenue we do evening programs specifically for teachers, um, you can be in the loop for all of our content offerings, um, all of the top scholars that we're bringing in, all of the conversations that we're having. Um, we want to make sure that you have as easy access to all of that material as possible. Um, so get in touch. Um, feel free to kind of take some time. Uh, constitutioncenter.org is the website. Um, feel free to explore. Uh, if you do have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to us. Um, but send along an email, uh, let us know, um, get in touch, and we're happy to continue the constitutional conversation with you um, and engage in any way that will be beneficial to you and your students. Um, because as sort of returning to the point that I made at the beginning of this program, um, is that we all owe all of you such a big thank you for the work that you do day in, day out to facilitate and engage students about the Constitution, about civics and government. Um, and we really want to be here to help in any way that we can. So if any of the resources that we provide, the professional development sessions, the online learning sessions, um, whatever it is that you need, um, let us know. Um, and if 
what we do makes your days just a little bit easier um, than our day is well spent. Um, so that's sort of my concluding remark there. Uh, thank you um, to Brianna and thank you to all of our teachers. Um, and that's it. Let me know if you have any questions, but thank you all for, for having me today. And we look forward to continuing our constitutional conversation and learning with you. Yes. Thank you so much for coming on. I know, um, once again, we just want to say thank you. And if you are, let me try to move us over there. Um, so again, if you are joining us live, A, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, and if you you know, again, have any questions about the Scholar Exchange info, just popped up Kevin's email on the screen there. If you have questions about, you know, general resource questions or ideas or things like that, um, please email me, um, brianna.krupski at main.gov. Um, I will be uploading this live session um, to the main DOE YouTube channel. Um, so that will be found there. I think I will probably be able to add some links in there. Um, but also we have our Civics Fellows newsletter that is out that you can also subscribe to on the DOE website. And I will be sharing out these resource links in our next monthly update. Um, and we also will have like a little Padlet resource too coming down the pipe. So um, plenty of ways to find us. Thank you very much, Kevin, for telling Maine teachers all about the goodness of the NCC resources. And I really appreciate having you on here. Absolutely. Thank you all so much. Awesome. Well, thank you, Kevin. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Thank you all for coming. And those of you that did a join live, if you need a certificate, you're just going to email me. Um, so again, the email was... Brianna.Krupski at main.gov. Um, so if you can get an hour of PD time. Um, so feel free to email me that and you can get that certificate from us. And I really appreciate you jumping on and I hope you liked learning about some of the resources they have.